Hello everybody, my name is Donna Gans. I'm a National Nurse Director with Lymphoma Australia. Um, this week we were to be in um, Frankfurt in Germany to be part of the European Haematology Association, otherwise known as EHA Congress, um, which is one of the main international haematology conferences. Um, however, due to COVID-19 and travel restrictions, this conference was changed to a virtual and online platform so that we were able to still receive the latest information and research in lymphoma and CLL. We are speaking to some of the Australian lymphoma experts about the highlighted presentations that were conducted at the conference. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Robin Gasowski, who is a consultant hematologist from Concord Hospital located in Sydney. Welcome, Robin. Thanks for having me, Doc. Thank you for joining me. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a few of the different um, key presentations that you felt um, were some, some of them quite practice changing, I think, um, at the, the conference and some of your insight will be fantastic and, and particularly one of the, um, the presentations that we're, we're mainly going to be talking about is an international randomised study. It was also presented at ASCO, which is the big American cancer conference a couple of mm -hmm. weeks ago and again at EHA this week. And the study is called Keynote 204 um, that was featuring patients with relapsed or refractory classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, would you better give us a little bit of a rundown about the study that you're actually one of the lead investigators and co-authors of this study as well. So it'd be great to get your insight. Thank you. Yeah, so, so this, as you say, was a study for patients with relapsed or refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, we have excellent treatments for Hodgkin lymphoma and, and as you know, we are lucky enough to be able to cure the vast majority of uh, patients with early stage and even advanced stage uh, disease. But there are a group of patients who relapse or, are, who, don't, or who don't respond to that initial treatment. Um, some of those patients can go on to have intensive chemotherapy and uh, stem cell transplant and, and can be cured by that approach. Uh, but some of those patients will later relapse. And, and some patients don't respond to any chemotherapy, uh, have what we call primary refractory disease. And those patients uh, together are a really difficult uh, group of patients to treat. And, that, and that's the patient group who were being looked at in this, in this trial. So um, this was a, a large study conducted at multiple countries across the world, North, South America, Europe, uh, and in Australia, including uh, at my hospital at Concord. Uh, it was comparing two different treatments. So the first of those is brentuximab or brentuximab pedotin is its full name. So this is a, a targeted therapy. It's a, a monoclonal antibody which binds to CD30, a protein expressed on the surface of the Hodgkin lymphoma cells. And the antibody binds to the surface of the cell and the, the antibody is conjugated to a toxin, a toxin called MMAE. And that whole uh, complex is taken up by the uh, malignant cell uh, and that results in uh, the death of, of the Hodgkin lymphoma cell. And, and that treatment's been around for a while and, and has been shown to be uh, effective uh, in this patient group. The newer treatment that was being tested in this study is pembrolizumab, a, a PD-1 antibody. Now th these are drugs that probably a lot of people will have heard about now because th these uh, immune therapies or checkpoint blockers as they're sometimes called um, are quite unique uh, amongst cancer treatments in that they seem to work really extraordinarily well across a, a very large range of different cancers. Uh, and they're used by our oncology co colleagues in, in, in uh, cancers like lung cancer, melanoma, where they've really uh, changed practice. But in fact, um, Hodgkin lymphoma is, is, is particularly sensitive to treatment with uh, pembrolizumab and, and patients seem to respond, uh, with, with Hodgkin lymphoma seem to respond better than um, even all of those other, other cancers where these drugs are used. So Hodgkin lymphoma can express uh, proteins called PDL1 and PDL2, which essentially work to dampen down the body's own immune response to the cancer. Uh, the the uh, body is trying to get rid of the cancer cells uh, by using its immune system. T cells can come in and attack the cancer cells. And those T cells express something called PD-1, 
um, which when the PDL1 from the cancer binds to that, the T cells don't work as well. The, the immune response is, is dampened down. So pembrolizumab works by coming in, binding to the PD1 on the T cells and uh, really um, stopping the cancer from dampening down the immune system. So the immune system is then able to uh, uh, do its job and, and, and hopefully clear the cancer cells. And uh, we've known from earlier trials that pembrolizumab seems to work very well in Hodgkin lymphoma. We've had this other drug, brentuximab, that we use in, in patients who are relapsing after transplant or who can't get to transplant. And this trial was comparing those, those two treatments. So we had over 300 patients treated at various sites around the world, and they were randomized to receive either pembrolizumab or brentuximab for up to two years of treatment, coming in for their infusions every three weeks. What this trial showed, and the sort of headline result, is that pembrolizumab is more effective at keeping the lymphoma under control. So the progression-free survival, how long the lymphoma stays under control for, was significantly longer uh, in the patients who received pembrolizumab at uh, 13 months, compared to only eight months in the patients who received brentuximab. Importantly as well, the uh, pembrolizumab seemed to be very well tolerated. So these drugs don't tend to cause the same sort of side effects that we see with chemotherapy. They don't tend to make you sick, they don't tend to make your hair fall out. The side effects of pembrolizumab are related to its mechanism of action, that they are sort of amping up the immune response. And so patients can get immune side effects. And that can be things like a skin rash. Um, it can affect their thyroid gland, so they can develop an underactive thyroid and need to go on to thyroxine tablets. The most serious side effect that we see in a small proportion of patients who get pembrolizumab is, is inflammation in the lungs. Um, and that is something that we need to monitor for. If patients do develop that, it usually settles down quite quickly with some uh, steroid treatment. Uh, but that can make giving further doses of the drug difficult. Brentuximab, on the other hand, its major side effect and something that we've known about for a while is this problem of neuropathy, so numbness in the fingers and toes. And, and in some patients that can get quite severe and even develop weakness um, uh, in those same areas. Uh, and that, that can limit our ability to, to deliver this drug. So even though patients in theory can keep going with this drug if it's still working and keeping the lymphoma under control, often the development of this neuropathy means we have to stop treatment and then think about um, other options. So uh, this trial is important because we've had these drugs, both of these drugs available for these patients, but we've not known which one is, is the best one to use. Um, and we're in a really fortunate position in Australia where both of these drugs are actually available, funded through the PBS, and the, the criteria that patients have to meet are pretty similar for both of them. So this trial does have the potential to be immediately practice changing because we have a choice of these drugs. And I, I think now most clinicians should probably be choosing pembrolizumab over brentuximab as the frontline treatment for these uh, patients with relapsed or refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. Great. And if um, if patients were to, in, in real life, I guess, um, relapse on either one of them, can they then receive the other drug? They can, they can. And look, I, I guess what we really want, obviously, is to, is to cure these patients. And we, we have three major treatment tools to use in these people, brentuximab, pembrolizumab, and allogeneic stem cell transplant. So these patients might have failed autologous stem cell transplant, having their own stem cells reinfused and high dose chemotherapy, but allogeneic transplant, transplant from somebody else, does have the potential to cure some of these patients. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's still one of the unanswered questions is how, exactly to, to, to best use this combination of tools. We know that a proportion of patients can actually be cured with brentuximab on its own, although it's only a small proportion. Um, my feeling is that we, we will see similar long-term uh, responses and possible cures in some of the patients who've received pembrolizumab, um, some of those who, who do get a complete response, but unfortunately those are the minority. Uh, and yes, you're correct that um, 
if they have failed one of these drugs, they can then go on to the other one. Uh, we, we can look at then options like allogeneic stem cell transplant to hopefully um, try and cure these patients. That's great. And obviously it's very dependent on the person's age and their general health too, is maybe what drug you might choose as well. Um, um, to some extent, look, look, both of these drugs are, are overall well tolerated and can be used in, in, in even very elderly patients. Um, uh, we're currently participating in a study called the Plymouth study where patients uh, with untreated Hodgkin lymphoma, older patients where chemotherapy is often a bit more complicated, actually receive pembrolizumab as a frontline therapy. Uh, and I would be happy to prescribe this drug to patients really of almost any age because it, its side effect profile is very good. But the main patients where perhaps we'd be cautious are those with underlying lung issues because of that inflammatory lung problem or people who already have um, underlying autoimmune diseases. Similarly, brentuximab is less attractive for people who already have neuropathy, which can be a side effect from previous chemotherapy treatments. Mm. Um, so, so that may direct the treatment decision to some extent, but now we have pretty solid data that if we want to give the treatment that keeps the lymphoma under control for longer, it appears the pembrolizumab is, is better. Okay, that sounds really good to know that yeah that we have a bit of a, more of an idea of which treatments might be better for this group because it's not exactly a, a standard mm. um, treatment at the moment for this relaxed yeah. group. So thank you so much for that overview. In the same session um, at EHA, there was also a study that was um, described as another potentially practice changing um, uh, presentation as well from the German um, Hodgkin study group. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this was the results from the HD17 study. So we sort of split Hodgkin lymphoma into early stage, so disease confined to one side of the diaphragm, uh, usually above the diaphragm, or more advanced stage uh, disease where the disease is more widely spread. But that early stage disease can be split into favorable or unfavorable, depending on how many sites of disease you have, whether you have a large mediastinal mass. Um, uh, because for patients with, with more disease, the unfavorable risk group, uh, our treatments are tailored uh, for them. They generally get a little bit more treatment uh, than, than patients who, who have what we call favorable risk disease. So this study was for patients with early stage unfavorable risk disease. Um, and, and that name is in some ways a bit of a misnomer. And I have this conversation with patients because it's not, these patients still do very well, it's just that they need a, a little bit more, um, more treatment than those with the favorable risk disease. Um, so, so standard treatment for those patients in Australia, most people would give four cycles of ABVD therapy and then follow it up with radiotherapy. And patients do do very well with, with that approach. But there are still some patients uh, who relapse and there is concern about the long-term toxicity, particularly of the radiotherapy. So a lot of these patients will have um, disease in the mediastinum in the middle of their chest. And if they need radiotherapy to that area, it will involve um, some treatment to the heart, which can lead to heart problems down the track. And in particularly in young females, we worry about the exposure to the breast because of the risk of breast cancer down the track. So th this was a study where patients initially received two cycles of more intensive chemotherapy, a regime called escalated Birkop, uh, and then went on to have two cycles of ABVD. Um, now in the control arm, uh, patients um, uh, then received uh, radiotherapy, but in the experimental arm, patients had an end, uh, a PET scan after four cycles, and if that PET scan was negative, uh, they could simply be uh, observed and uh, emit uh, radiotherapy. And so therefore potentially avoid the long-term uh, toxicities of, of that treatment. Um, the results for this study were really very impressive. Um, the progression-free overall survival uh, was well above 90 uh, in fact, I think above 95% uh, for patients tr uh, treated um, in, in both arms. Um, 
the comment from the uh, presenter which stuck with me was that this was the first time the Germans have done a, uh, a Hodgkin lymphoma study and they've, they've done many studies, they, they really are the world leaders in, in, in how we treat Hodgkin lymphoma. This was the first study where they, uh, the overall survival at five years for the patients in the trial was the same as the general population. So uh, there was no uh, increased risk of death. And, and how fantastic is that to be able to tell patients that, you know, you, you, you actually are not, even though you've got this disease, you're not at higher risk of dying than somebody who, who doesn't have this. Uh, and that's because they've managed to reduce um, the chances of the lymphoma coming back. Uh, but as importantly, they're starting to be able to reduce the toxicity of the treatments because there's only two rounds of the more intensive chemotherapy rather than giving more, which can sometimes cause problems. And they're able to get rid of the radiotherapy as well for, for the patients who, who are PET negative at the end of treatment. So um, there's still a bit of nervousness about this more intensive treatment, this escalated beer cop using that as a frontline therapy. Um, and, and so I don't know that this will be offered, well, I, this will not be used to treat every patient with unfavorable risk Hodgkin lymphoma, but it is another option to discuss with patients. And, and I think it is, it is potentially um, uh, quite attractive. Well, that sounds really good. And, and good to again have that information there ready for clinicians such as yourself yeah. to make that decision with the patient. So that's been. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robin, and and thank you um, for joining us through this um, yeah, yeah tough time for a lot of health professionals across the world. And um, with COVID nineteen, it's a very challenging time, and for, especially for health professionals and, and patients alone. But um, thank you. Yeah, and I think as we were discussing just before I, uh, we started recording, um, I, I did want to flag one final study, which was. Um, a study uh, reporting the outcomes uh, for patients who received uh, CAR T cells in the UK for relapsed uh, high-grade lymphoma. Um, and, and the study showed that patients, these were patients who were getting the drug off trial through the NHS it, it, through a fairly rigorous program. And um, I don't really want to dwell too much on the results, which showed that the, the results were broadly similar to, to what we've seen in clinical trials. Um, but at the end of the talk, uh, the presenter did flag um, a picture of one of the first CAR T specialist nurses in the UK who worked at University College London, uh, a 44 year old lady um, called Jenny Sabalayan, who uh, unfortunately died from uh, complications of coronavirus, um, COVID 19, um, just a couple of months ago. And I think you know, we have heard about the reports of uh, nurses and doctors dying overseas from, um, from this coronavirus, but to see such a, a young woman um, who had a uh, young family um, die from the complications of this disease, to, to me emphasised, I, I guess, how lucky we've been in Australia. And um, hopefully the, the rates of infection continue to remain low uh, as, as we um, ease off restrictions over the coming months. But uh, I guess it it does show we still need to be still need to be careful. Yeah, totally, and I think we're we're doing well in Australia, but yeah, it's still that risk and knowing what's going on overseas, we don't want to see anyone else losing their yeah. life illness. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Robin, for your overview of uh, each of those um, studies, and and thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thank you.